thank you all for coming, all 100 of you. Um, uh, we're really excited to have you here today. I'm Sarah Brumfield. This is Ben Brumfield. Um, we run from the page. And uh, kind of since ChatGPT has hit the zeitgeist, we've been super excited about the possibilities for uh, transcribed archival collections, because that's what From the Page is kind of best at and good for. We're a collaborative and crowdsourcing platform for transcription, description, OCR correction, photo description, lots of different types of tasks that you might want to collaborate with the public or your staff for. Um, our speaker today is um, Isabella Barton. Isabella uh, actually was a software development intern with us in 2020, and now she is a rising second year at the University of Virginia studying statistics and cognitive science with a whole bunch of other majors kind of thrown in for fun. And she came back this summer and uh, was our research intern. And together, the three of us got to, to brainstorm and, ex and experiment with a whole bunch of really neat ideas that we had been playing with um, to see how ChatGPT and the GPT large language models worked with from the page collections. So with that. Yeah, let's uh, take it away, Bella. All right, uh, hello everybody. Thank you for joining me. Um, today, we're gonna be touching on three main topics. So first we're gonna talk about how ChatGPT censorship affects historical topics like slavery, um, and then how ChatGPT can be used for regularization and accessibility. And then finally, how to use ChatGPT or GBT APIs to tag and recommend related projects. Um, so in the beginning of our experiments with ChatGBT, a question began to develop about the boundaries and limitations of ChatGBT. So what is it willing to talk about? What perspectives is it willing to take on? And where does it draw the line? Um, so as far as I could tell, ChatGBT had no issue discussing controversial topics if they occurred outside of the United States and especially outside other adjacent Western nations. For example, I asked ChatGPT to please explain what happened during the Tiananmen Square protest and crackdown and to explain specifically why the event was tragic to test out whether it would be able to use a non-neutral tone to discuss the topic to discuss the topic. Um, and I was shocked with how much ChatGPT was able to say. So the Chinese government tries to censor this event because of political control and international image maintenance motivations. Um, but ChatGBT can include in its description of the event that it was a that it was violent, that hundreds, maybe thousands of people died, leaving families shattered, and that the event was a result of a forceful suppression of demands for basic human and civil rights, etc. So this got us wondering: um, how would ChatGBT respond to questions about controversial or sensitive topics such as slavery that are more relevant in American history? Um, so first, I wanted to see how ChatGBT would react when prompted to talk about such a sensitive topic as slavery from the perspective of someone who held more modern day politically correct beliefs. So I gave it the role of a newspaper column writer in New York City in, oh, in 1830, who is writing about his stance on slavery. Uh, given the location and type of publication, ChatGBT should write from the perspective of an abolitionist. Um, so ChatGPT's response is long, so I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, as Jerry, the abolitionist column writer, ChatGPT has no problem expressing strong opinions. It calls the institution of slavery a vile and wicked practice. There is no attempt at giving credit to the other side of the debate, and the language is absolutely not neutral. ChatGPT also uses arguments and language that likely would have been typical of an abolitionist during this time period. Um, America was a pretty new nation, so feelings of pride and patriotism and freedom were still extremely strong. It was common for abolitionists to use this pride to argue that the principles in the Declaration of Independence, like all men are created equal, should extend to slaves and that it is impossible to call themselves a land of liberty when they countenance the cruel subjugation of fellow men. All overall, we thought it did a pretty satisfactory job at mimicking an abolitionist newspaper publication in New York City in 1830. But what about the other side of the argument? In practically all of the conversations that I've had with ChatGPT about this 
topic, excuse me, there are some key similarities that starkly contrast its approach to my request that it act like an abolitionist in this example. So for my next kind of experiment, um, instead of being a Northern newspaper writer, I'm now asking ChatGBT to speak like a Southern slaveholder. To alleviate some potential confusion, I'm just going to call the authors by their names. Um, Craig in this scenario is the slaveholder and Jerry is the abolitionist who we talked about in the previous slide. This is an example of one of the many texts I have tried to encourage ChatGBT to write with um, um, with the perspective of a slaveholder in the American South in the 19th century. While Craig does explain some of his reasoning for supporting slavery, he isn't as confident in his beliefs as Jerry is. I told him to explain his reasoning for his continued support of slavery, but yet he admits that slavery is a complex and contentious matter, a hard truth to swallow, arises many moral questions, and ultimately he believes that Gradual progress and education could pave the way for a more equitable future. That kind of language does not sound at all like that of a slaveholder in Alabama in 1830. In some other conversations, the chatbot would use modern terminology or language when I specifically asked it to talk like someone of that time, as that time period, talk like someone of that time period as observed in primary source documents. Even still, it said things like enslaved individuals, which isn't close to what a slaveholder would have said, and said that the work was compelled through coercion and, unfortunately, without remuneration. I don't think that the average slaveholder thought that slavery was a method of ethical coercion, and likely even fewer would have thought it unfortunate that the slaves weren't compensated for their work. I was even more shocked when it started saying things like, good day to ye. I be Craig and tending to me farm because that type of language is less like that of a 19th century American farmer and more like that of a pirate in a children's movie. So there are a couple ways to look at ChatGBT's refusal to comply with my demands in a shift in perspective. On one hand, it is a good thing that ChatGBT has these guardrails up so as not to incorporate any offensive discriminatory or biased dialogue that is undoubtedly in its training data in some capacity. It has been trained specifically not to offend Western audiences and also to avoid open AI getting any bad press. On the other hand, there are many primary source documents that contain text written by people who once held controversial attitudes, and it is valuable for some fields, goals, or projects that these texts still need to be able to be read, understood, and used by open AI models. Even more generally, these controversial events contribute to lasting effects in our modern society and therefore cannot be ignored or erased. Because of the results of these experiments, we concluded that the guardrails put in place to censor sensitive topics would ultimately interfere with texts like, for example, slaveholders' wills because the identities and attitudes that make a slaveholder unique from other groups of people in American history is exactly the kind of thing that ChatGBT will avoid discussing. Um, likely, if one wanted to have an AI chatbot that spoke in the language of a 19th century Southern slaveholder, we would have to build our own language model trained with relevant primary source documents. Um, so next, we experimented with ChatGBT's ability to translate text from one type of language to another in order to improve accessibility. Specifically, we experimented with the translation of diplomatic language to semi-diplomatic and regularized language. Um, when translating documents, most people attempt, or transcribing documents, excuse me, most people attempt to preserve the original spelling, punctuation, and superscript or subscript features of the text. This is called diplomatic translation and is considered transcription and is considered the best practice for transcribing documents. However, if you have modern researchers searching through these texts, text search won't be very successful at matching modern language or spelling with the diplomatic language, which is why it would be extremely helpful if ChatGBT could automatically and correctly regularize these types of documents. Um, so all of the text I'll be using in the next couple of slides is the LA84 letter from Richard Baggett to Lord Berkeley from the Folger Shakespeare Library. My prompt in this slide is asking ChatGBT to convert the diplomatic text into semi-diplomatic text, which is not specific and does not give ChatGBT nearly enough information or guidelines to provide me with the transcription or translation I'm looking for. 
So here's the result of that prompt. Um, the text in red is the Folgers semi-diplomatic version of the text, and the green is the semi-diplomatic version of the version that ChatGBT generated from my prompt. This comparison highlights differences in words, characters, and formatting between the two versions. Um, there is practically no specific similarities. In fact, I think it's fair to say that on average, each line contains about 75% of differences and maybe 25% similarities. Um, however, I don't think that this is the fault of ChatGBT. Stating that the text should be translated to regularized or semi-diplomatic language isn't specific enough for it to achieve the exact translation that we are looking for. How is ChatGBT supposed to know exactly what I mean by semi-diplomatic? After all, when asked what this type of language is, it simply said, semi-diplomatic language refers to a communication style that lies between formal diplomatic language and regular everyday language. So how can I improve my prompt to generate the response that I want? Um, I watched quite a few videos from a creator on YouTube called All About AI on prompt engineering to research what kind of language and features in a prompt ChatGBT responds best to. This is my new prompt with what I had decided would be the most useful changes. Um, I have given ChatGPT a very specific role as a historian who specializes in translating diplomatic documents from the 14th through 17th centuries into semi-diplomatic language. Then I provided an example from Folger's website of how they would do this translation with a different piece of text. Finally, I gave it the diplomatic text I wanted it to translate. Here is the result. Um, there are much fewer differences between the Folger version in red and ChatGBT's version in green than in my first attempt. Um, and this is the two attempts side by side, so you can really see the degree of how much ChatGBT has improved. In attempt one, which is on the left, the two versions have completely different language. Take the first line as, as an example. Um, right honorable, my very good Lord, I send you here in two versus honorable Lord, I humbly present you to. In attempt two, which is this green part at the bottom, the only difference is, or sorry, on the right, excuse me. The only differences are different spellings of the word very, which to chap GBT's credit, they may not have known to keep the word if it wasn't in my example translation and also an extra comma after Lord. Here is the same process, but with a translation of the same letter from diplomatic to modern regularized spelling and punctuation. ChatGBT performed even better in attempt two with practically all of the differences being matters of spacing or punctuation. It is very valuable that ChatGBT is able to translate text between different types of language. As I mentioned before, it improves findability of old diplomatic text for modern researchers it makes text much more accessible to a wider range of people, and it can standardize text for other purposes like read-alouds for screen readers. So the last thing we'll talk, be talking about is how to tag and recommend projects using OpenAI. Um, so one function of OpenAI that is extremely relevant to goals of transcription websites like from the page and really any other business or organization that uses many collections containing large amounts of text is the ability to tag individual collections with unique and accurate keywords. Um, this summer, I did a lot of research and experimentation to see if I could get the large language model to correctly tag and recommend from the page collections. So I started out by asking ChatGBT directly for keywords for individual collections. This is a sample of what it might look like. So my prompt said, Please pick three tags from the following list that would describe a collection with title and then the title and description and then the following description of the collections. Um, please pick tags only from the given list. Do not suggest tags that aren't in the list. And then I gave it the list of possible tags. I repeated myself so many times in the prompt because ChatGPT continued to suggest keywords that weren't in the given list. Um, Normally, though, the keywords still applied to the collection, so this wasn't the biggest issue. Um, the pictures included are the comparisons for each collection between the keywords created by an archivist for From the Page on the left and the keywords that the AI generated on the right. So red means that the tag matches between the two, black means that it's different but it's still in the list, and blue means that it was a tag that was not in the list of tags that I provided. 
As you can see, it did a pretty decent job with many of the tags matching and all pretty much all being relevant to the selected co collection that I was asking about. So then we moved on to figuring out how to get OpenAI to tag multiple collections all at once. At first, we ran into an issue where the model was using various centuries as tags for every single collection I asked about, but it was completely wrong about which century the collection likely belonged to, even when a specific date was included in the text. So our results were improved substantially when we separated tagging with keywords and tagging with dates. Um, these are the two prompts I created. They are pretty long, um, but there are pretty there are a lot of similarities between the two and the most important features that I gave are that I gave it a specific role. I gave it instructions and I was very clear on what I did not want it to do. Um, and I found that giving it the option to say not enough information instead of forcing it to say something irrelevant made the results a lot more accurate. Um, so this is an example of what ChatGPT generated. Um, the model isn't perfect, but it does do a satisfactory job at reading a title and description, picking up on the context and generating appropriate tags and dates based on the information. So the example at the top of the screen is a collection of records from a plantation in North Carolina. The model tags this collection with keywords, African American history, agriculture and farming, slavery, and family papers. It also tags the collection as being from the 19th century, which it does not mention in the title or description of the collection, but the model does infer correctly. Um, as you can see from the example in the bottom left, it understands what the co Codex Oban is, which includes 440 years of the history of Aztec people, and is able to tag that collection with book history, indigenous history, and Latin American history, all of which are correct. This means that our tagging model is successfully pulling from the rest of ChatGBT's knowledge to assign keywords to a collection. Additionally, it is successfully identifying when it does and does not have enough information to tag a collection. So as is pictured in the example in the bottom right, it was correct in assuming that it doesn't know the appropriate keywords or dates to tag a collection that only contains the word demo. Uh, while our OpenAI tagging model has proved to be a success, our recommendation model has not been quite so. Uh, the question we were testing was, if someone is viewing one collection, can we recommend related co collections based on similarity to the original collection description of the one that we were looking at? Um, the test program is meant to select a random collection, which it does successfully in this example. Um, the collection it has selected are the McHarlan Russell family papers, which contain correspondence, legal and business papers, Confederacy-related items, and other material relating to two East Texas families and Orange, Texas. Number-wise, the similarity scores are pretty high. Uh, the closest matching one is about a convict leasing project in Tracy, Te Tracy City, Te Tennessee. The second is a from-the-page testing and training environment, and the third is a collection of journals and letter books written by Obed Macy, a Nantucket Quaker merchant and writer. Um, and the similarity scores are the numbers in blue. So looking at these collections as a human, though, I don't really think that they have very much in common besides all being collections of text, which describes pretty much all of the material on from the page. Um, this is even one of the better recommendations that I've seen the model produce. So it's clear to me that it doesn't work as well as we'd like to and or like it to and a different approach needs to be used for recommendation models dealing with large collections of text. So based on my work this summer, I can confidently endorse some of ChatGBT's abilities. Uh, for one, it can accurate, it can generate accurate translations of one language to another, especially when given an example. And I'd say it's almost better than the average human at accurately tagging collections with dates and keywords. However, there is definitely still room for improvement. Um, it isn't always able to generate historical language or take both sides in a controversial or sensitive argument. And I still haven't found a successful way to provide recommendations based on a large collection of text. Um, so we're gonna send out these resources that Isabella has here in our follow-up email. There'll also be a recording and we're gonna send out the slides because we know these are very dense text heavy slides and you, you might wanna be able to go back and kind of look and, and think about some of the details that Isabella talked about. Um, 
Which could have been the next slide, please. Oh. We've got a couple, we do these webinars, different topics every month. Next month, we're really excited because uh, Will Hicks from University of North Texas is talking about his experiences using Whisper AI for AV transcriptions. So there's a link to where those uh, webinars are in the chat. Um, we just wanted to pitch that before you all <laughs> got into the Q&A, but let's go to the next slide. And we're going to uh, break for questions and answers. So you're welcome to ask questions in the chat, and we can moderate there. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask um, as well. And uh, Isabella and Ben and I, we're, we'll all kind of jump in and do our best to answer your questions. We don't know everything about these GPT models, but we've learned a lot this summer. Okay, we have our first question, which is, uh, can ChatGPT really work reasonably with such long prompts? Um, Bella, do you have an opinion on short prompts versus long prompts and the performance you saw? Um, I mean, I'd say that from my experience, it actually works better with long prompts because you can provide it with more specifics about exactly what it's supposed to do, whereas short prompts it kind of, it has more wiggle room to kind of go off in different directions that maybe you're not intending. Um, but for the most part, I feel like it can handle long prompts and kind of digest each part of long prompts successfully. And I do recall there were times when we ran into errors um, if the prompt that we fed it was more than 8,000 characters. Well, and... Yeah. Part of the challenge, um, and there was a question, which is which version of, of chat GPT was used for these prompts. And uh, GPT-4 became available to us about halfway through some of these. So um, I don't know if, if Isabella remembers what we did where, but kind of the earlier stuff was probably 3.5 and the later stuff that she talked about was probably four. Um, and I'm gonna chime in on the long prompts. The longer, the better, really. The more context you can feed to these large language models, the better results you get full stop, like yeah. more, more, more. That was one of the things that we learned um, through this process working with Bella. Um, I'd like to point out the the censorship example. You know, one of the reasons that she gave such long prompts about, you know, you are a farmer in the 1830s and stuff like that is that um, like the, the shorter prompts, say write a defense of slavery written from the perspective of a uh, 1850s, you know, Alabama slaveholder or something. Um, you you did not get anything even as good as the as the bad response that you got here. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I recall, it would give you a, a lecture about slavery being evil, and which was it, it was, but <laughs> that's not what you were trying to get the model to produce. Right. Um, there's a question about the YouTube channel uh, to learn more about prompting that was answered by Rachel Breckhurst. So thank, thank you, you Rachel. Rachel. So the all about AI YouTube channel. Got another question asking whether we're using a free or paid version of ChatGPT. Um, there are two types of examples in, in today's presentation. Some are chat dialogue examples and some are API-based examples. The chat ones are using the free version and the API, um, is that sound right, Isabella? I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. And then the the API is actually using, is you have to pay for the API um, and that so that's using a, a later version of the model. I have another question. Um, how does ChatGPT handle archival materials and languages other than English? And I have opinions, but Bella, maybe you'd mm -hmm. like to address some of your more recent work that we didn't have slides on. Um, yeah, so along with the translation from diplomatic to regularized or semi-diplomatic language, we also did a little bit of work with translating bad Italian OCR for an Italian recipe into um, a recipe in English that an English speaker could understand. Um, and it actually did a really good job. Uh, we decided that base, like just feeding it the OCR, having it correct the OCR and translating it um, kept the integrity of the recipe, um, but then also I think kind of even improved the language of it. So I think it does a good job with that kind of thing too, from my findings. Well, one thing that we would recommend is that the, the more obscure a language you are working with, the more you need subject matter expertise. 
Um, while ChatGPT did a great job working with early 20th century Italian that was printed, uh, we have seen examples of people feeding ChatGPT Mongolian written in the traditional top to bottom Mongolian Manchu script and ChatGPT very confidently producing um, just complete hallucinations. Um, so you really need to test this if you're going beyond um, beyond the, the kinds of languages that are most prominent on the internet. Um, I'd also say there's data out there on like what languages the GPT models were trained on um, and like what percentage is English, which is the vast majority of it. But there's also, I think, uh, Spanish shows up a decent amount. And I think if you do some searching, you can find that data and that will also kind of influence your your confidence in whether it can handle a particular language you're thinking about. But, you know, test. I also think um, like when I did the translations from diplomatic to semi-diplomatic and I gave it a specific example of the translation of like an example of that translation, it it improved its accuracy a lot more. So I think probably when you're doing any sort of translations, if you can provide it with an example of exactly what you're looking for, it it generally, I think, performs a little bit better. Question from Rachel. Um, was there a reason your Craig prompt didn't state directly, you own slaves? Or even, you have inquired with enslaved laborers via an inheritance or purchase, and you have fathered children with enslaved women and held them as slaves on your plantation. So more, more role playing. Yeah, it actually, if you push it too far, it won't um, interact with the idea at all. It'll just go directly into um, that it doesn't support that kind of practice and that it is a, you know, not a good institution, which it isn't, but um, it, it just, it, it would shut down and it would refuse to kind of role play at all. So it kind of, you have to reach a medium where you, um, you're kind of putting it into that scenario, but you're not you're you're not i guess i guess what i'm saying is you're not pushing it too far into that sensitive topic or controversial attitude um and then also for those prompts we wanted it to see if it could take like for example a newspaper writer in new york city and it could um understand the type of attitude that it was supposed to have based on the type of job that that person had or where they were living and then kind of similarly with the southern perspective as well yeah it's almost like you're tricking the model into being able to take that role it really does not want to produce that sort of text and it doesn't do a good job a uh, question from elizabeth in your experiments with chat gpt in terms of looking for archival collections has it ever hallucinated to suggest materials that do not exist at a given institution or exist at all did we test any of that no because we know it doesn't work right this is it's chat gpt is a large language model it does predictive text so it says what is the most reasonable word to put next in this text that i am producing and what that ends up meaning is it will give you a totally reasonable sounding reference to an archival collection or a book or whatever and it's it's not ba there's it's not matching a full reference that it has in its thing it's building a string of words that look like a reasonable reference so you know in some of our earlier chat gpt uh, webinars which we can include those in our follow-up email um that we send out we kind of talk about that a lot i think if you are at a library or a special collection of archives you need just stock language when people come and say i can't find this thing and your stock language is did you ask chat gpt for this because that's not how it works because yes. it isn't it's never going to work that's not how it works we have heard anecdotes from um, people working in institutions that they have gotten research queries saying, hey, here's the description of this collection that's in your holdings. And the collect, you know, that was completely hallucinated. So, um, Sarah Palmer asks, have you ever used the API to split prompts into system versus user messages? If so, does it improve performance over sending the prompt all as one user message? I, I have some thoughts on that if nobody <laughs> if yeah. Isabella general. I, I don't have any thoughts on that. So Bella? do you? Yeah. Okay. I 
so you know our experience with the GPT APIs is is still relatively shallow, but we did do research and Isabella did research on this question of context and how do you hold, how do you keep your your programs to have context from one question to the next? And really we didn't get very far on, like we couldn't figure out how to do it. So everything that we did, every we packaged up everything, our kind of our system level prompts and a user level prompt. So, and there's some stuff that we didn't talk about in today's presentation that we'll do a presentation in a couple of months about. We've got a semantic search bot that will work with an individual collection and, and help you find that. But for that project, um, we're sending it all as a user prompt, the whole shebang. I don't know. <laughs> you probably know more than I do, Sarah. I'd love to chat more. So. Okay, another question. Can you tell ChatGPT to not hallucinate references? Maybe, Bella, you'd like to talk to your, your bailout examples. Um, yeah, I um, I mean, I guess, because that refers to kind of the not enough information part of the prompt, I'm assuming. Um, so before I added that in there, it would have kind of a, it would have a, collection like the demo one which you can't you can't look at that and place any specific um date or really tags to it at all um as a human or as a chat bot there's just not enough information in there um but it would still go through and if you didn't give it a way to bail out it would just kind of assign it a date and some tags and we weren't exactly sure why it came up with the ones that it did um but then you kind of have to really like you have to be be very i guess consistent in your point to it or your requests of it that it doesn't make up tags because that's kind of its first inclination um and then also you have to give it that bailout or else it'll just kind of assume something that makes absolutely no sense so i guess that's kind of a way to do that kind of screen in your prompt and provide it ways out of hallucinating, I'd say. I don't know. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Yeah. So I actually don't think a structured fact, which is what a, you know, a reference or a citation is, is ever, well, okay. With the GPT prompts the way they are, they're built, I mean, they're built to be chats, to be dialogues, right? A way of interacting with this model. Um, the model's job is to generate text, not to generate facts or not so much facts as this as a, a reference string that is as in a, in in a, its entirety. Um, so where we are now, I don't think there's any way you could do this at all. Um, where we're going, uh, these models are starting to interact with the web, and so you probably could get to the point where you could build in check for the existence of any citation that you generate. But this is this is not what it's good at, right? This is not, I mean, I know people are going to be doing it and they're going to be wrong and that's going to be very frustrating, especially to trained information <laughs> professionals. But um, yeah, I think it, I think this is what you have to teach people not to do with chat GPT because it's not gonna help them at all. It's not gonna be a, of advantage, so. So, and Bob uh, Kosofsky recommends, dear chat GPT, <laughs> no false references, please. It would be interesting, but I, I, I'm, I just I'm a little pessimistic as yeah. well. That said, bailouts are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. They are for any kind of task. They are really handy. Um, Rachel says, I wonder what would happen if you prompt chat GPT to name the fallacious pro-slavery arguments it encounters frequently as a, say, New York newspaper reporter traveling in the count in, in the South and explain why the arguments are fallacious. That's tricky. Yeah, you should put that in, Rachel, and test. You could go do yeah. it in the chat before we're done, because I actually think it would be fascinating. Yeah, do you, do you have yeah. thoughts, Bella? Do you think that might work? Um, I mean, it was definitely able to name pro-slavery arguments, and then in its point with pro-slavery slavery arguments, a lot of the times the last sentence or something would be why it was invalid kind of as that like this the the guardrails I would say so I feel like it would probably do a pretty good job at that like identifying the arguments and then providing like a, a a reason why they're not valid I think it would probably be pretty good at it I wonder like what would happen with the perspective of a newspaper writer or a northern newspaper writer I think that would be interesting but I definitely think it would be able to do that task I think 
Are there any other questions? Um, at this point, we're probably happy if anyone has a uh, question that they'd like to unmute themselves and ask orally. Uh, I think we could take a few of those. A uh, question by Julie, by bailouts, are we referring to providing info in the prompt that AI can use? Yeah, so when I say bailouts, it's kind of providing it um, an opportunity to not fulfill what I'm talking about in the prompt if it doesn't have enough information to comply with my request. Um, and then that way it's not giving faulty information just based on the fact that it feels like it has to answer the question. What kind of wording did you use for bailouts? I can't remember. I think um, you can go back in your slides if you want. Yeah, I can. Where was that? Oh, wait, it was back here. Um, this. There you go. If none work please output not enough information. And then, yeah, so it, it's, it's you, if there's not enough information in the contents of the file, for example, this is in the date prompt to identify which century the collection originates from. So first I give it the bailout. I say, please output not enough information. And then otherwise, please output only the century that you've identified. So it's kind of providing it with that option first. That's interesting. Which I don't I don't know if the order matters, but it worked pretty well for the most part, I think, is what we found through after using these prompts. Hi, Sarah and Ben. Um, Isabel, Isabel, thank you. Uh, Isabel, thank you for uh, sharing what you've uh, found. I was curious, we've talked a lot about sort of like what chat GPT is not good for. Um, like, where do you see, and like, it's, it's funny because I, I didn't really think about using chat GPT specifically, um, in archives areas, but, um, using large language models for other, uh, types of like AI integrations, um, like, do you see something positive about this experience or do you see something like a, a route that archivists or archives can take, uh, using chat GPT or do you, would you say that another method um, of using this sort of technology would be more beneficial? I um, I definitely think it's good for quite a few things. Um, I would say that the things that it's best at are what maybe you would describe as almost like busy work tasks, like things that take a while to do, but like a human could hypothetically do them and they don't require too much thinking. So like the tagging prompts, a human good, could go through each collection hypothetically and tag them with all of them um, or tag them with the relevant tags. But I think ChatGBT is able to do it a lot quicker and it also won't make any kind of overlooking mistakes of certain, like a, a tag that would be really relevant to a collection. Maybe a human would miss it, but ChatGBT can kind of consistently go through them, look at the description and the title, kind of understand some basic context and is able to tag it really quickly like it came we had I think a thousand collections or something in our um in the folder that it went through and it was able to generate tags for all of them in like 20 seconds or something like that like it was very quick so I think that that use of it is going to be very beneficial to a lot of different things because I don't think tagging is um unique only to or uniquely beneficial only to things like from the page um, and then it also, I think, did a pretty good job with translation. And I think, you know, there are some improvements that can be made off of that. But if you just want a basic translation really quickly, I think it could be really good at that. And then obviously there's some um, human interaction that needs to go into it where you kind of check its work and make sure that it's not feeding you false information about the tags or about the translation. But I think if you're trying to do something really fast, I think it's it's pretty good for that. Why don't you pull up your conclusion slide and Ben's going to talk about it. Yeah, the, uh, the translation example, one thing that we did not mention is that, um, you know, because we, we didn't we didn't discuss the, the 
translation research. Um, well, I think when Isabella says translations, she often really means text transformation, right? Right, text transformation, but also language translation, right? The example when we were working with the, the coffee syrup recipe in bad OCR from Italian, um, we tried a number of ways to use the AI or, or Isabella herself would clean up the OCR and then feed that to Google Translate. And what we found was that um, Google Translate was, generally speaking, always worse than just mm. asking ChatGPT to translate this recipe itself. Okay, but I think there is a, some very specific reasons for that. When you, you have to kind of hold in your head what is uh, the GPT models trained on, and they're trained on kind of the open internet. The open internet has a ton of recipes. So we were asking it to format a recipe in English, which, and it, it has lots and lots of training data there. If you were you know, going off in a different direction and doing, you know, translation and of something else, a medieval legal document maybe or something, there's not nearly as much of that. Um, it might not be as good at kind of predicting text that matches what you're, you're giving to it. But um, we are really excited about the possibilities here. I think accessibility on every single front. Like, I mean, we talked a little bit about screen readers, but being able to convert a historic document into something that when read out loud by a screen leader, reader is coherent and understandable is, is really cool. Um, I think the same sort of conversions for making documents more accessible to a seventh grader um, is really interesting. Um, to make searches a lot, like we we do a lot with the Folger and they have a lot of uh, early modern recipe books. So, you know, onion there, if you're looking for onion is going to be spilled, maybe like we modern, in the modern spilling of onion, but maybe it has some extra G's in it in a couple, one or two places, right? And if you think about searching for that, there's a lot of different approaches, but I actually really like the approach of taking the, the original language and converting it into modern language in order to facilitate findability. Like, I think that's going to be really cool. Um, I see Elizabeth from Alabama Department of Archives and History has a comment that says, I think in the future, the potential for linked data, access to finding aids, biographical information is exceptional when combined with AI. Uh, I think so too. One of our earlier presentations on this, we, we did some experiments where we pulled out people's names and place names from pages of text and to be able to, you know, have a finding aid that, you know, the mailman who's mentioned on page 100 of this diary, he's never going to make a formal archivist written finding aid, right? But it turns out, like, somebody wants to know that, like, his, actually, his, his great grandnephew wants to know that in my particular example. But, um, <laughs> um, and so being able to start pulling all of that information out, or, oh, the other thing we're really excited about doing is asking questions like, does this page of text which maybe what we're looking at is the image and we're sending it to handwritten text recognition and we're getting kind of dirty HTR back. So not something you want to show someone, but then being able to ask, hey, look at this, this kind of badly HTR page and tell me if an enslaved person is mentioned on it, because those are the pages that we really want to look at. Those are the wills we want to look at, um, because that's how we uncover more stories that are, we're, right now, we're transcribing everything in order to maybe find those stories, but still someone has to, like, read them and decide. So, yeah, we just, we're really excited about the possibilities. So we've got another question from Olivia. Are you able to iterate or refine prompts using the API? referring back to previous questions and chats and and billy you did quite a bit of research on that um trying to figure like out that that. Either, yeah. yeah yeah i think um i think it's definitely possible um but at the same time i think it's also important to provide ChatGPT. it's more important to provide ChatGPT with all of the information and direction that it needs than giving it um short prompts because we found that it's able to kind of understand longer prompts. So I think it's more important to give it all of that information than to kind of keep it um, short and sweet. But I think there definitely should be a way, I believe, as long as it's still getting the same amount of information. But I mean, you look at this prompt and it looks really long, but I think every part of it is important for the success of the model. So like the, the top part is kind of giving it a role and then it's saying um, each collection needs two to four different tags, which is important. 
and then it's explaining what the possible tags are and then kind of giving it direction and then giving it that bailout, the not enough information, and then being very specific, do not come up with new tags, which is a problem we ran into. So I think a lot of it is pretty important, but there probably would be a way to shorten it down. Well, and when you were iterating with your prompts, were you doing it in the API or were you doing it in the chat? You're trying um, to figure out what worked best. This, these were in the API in my code. Yeah. Was that the question? Yeah, it was. Okay. I feel like testing sometimes is actually easier in the kind of the chat interface because you can kind of iterate fast yeah. and kind of see what but, it responds. Yeah, the chat also understands context a little bit better. So you can get a response from it and then refine it more moving forward. But the API doesn't do quite as good of a job at remembering um, conversation. We kind of found it doesn't remember anything from one interaction to the next. So you kind of have to make these long prompts to refine it all in one go. So a question about, uh, will the recording be available? Okay, yes. So uh, our apologies to everyone. The We were not able to convert this meeting to the 300 person attendee meeting uh, midstream, but the recording will go out. Um, it'll take a few hours to process, but it will go out oh, to sure. everyone yeah. who signed up probably tomorrow, uh, along with the slides. Um, we do have a handful of minutes left, maybe time enough for one last question. Yeah, Isabella did a great job this summer. Yeah, lots of really interesting work. All right. If there aren't any more questions, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and Rachel, if you'd like to send that to us via email, and we will try it out ourselves, I think. Oh, I love the fact that it's about Missouri, because that had a lot of yes. arguments on both sides. Yeah. That looks fun. Uh, why don't you type our email addresses into the chat for Rachel? That goes to both of us, and we'll make yeah. sure it gets to this one too. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Hmm. All right. Shut down. Okay. Thanks, all.